Hello, everybody. This is John Finn, Church Without Walls International, CWOWI.org. We are a house church network. We celebrate the gathering of the saints by meeting in homes. We rotate who hosts and we rotate who leads at each meeting. Oftentimes, the host is also the one who's leading. Uh, we've had children lead house churches uh, within the, the guidance of their of their parents. The the, the, the fact of the matter is Christ is in every believer and he is doing amazing things in everybody. So a house church is about the ability to share what the Lord is doing in you. If you are going to something called a house church, but there's just one person or maybe two or three that do all the talking all the time, that's not a house church. That, that is just a miniature of the auditorium. Uh, so I encourage you to visit cwowi.org and learn about the biblically patterned house church. All right. Today, talking about uh, what if everything you believed was all wrong. You say, you know, what, what do you mean by that? Well, let's start with context. Everything starts with context. Everything starts with understanding what the New Testament was about. And let me say this, the New Testament was written by apostles doing church in a house to people who were doing church in the house. So no matter how many years you have believed, if you have pulled the context of the New Testament, if you pulled those verses, chapters and verses, out of the home to be applied in the auditorium, to be applied by the preacher in the pulpit who's speaking to a congregation in an auditorium setting, that is using the scripture out of context. Now, can you apply a verse in context while in that setting? Of course you can. But I'm saying the basic understanding, for instance, the way the, the, the five-fold ministry of Ephesians uh, you know, is talked about where it says that you know, he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the, you know, the, the edifying and the teaching and everything of the saints. That's put, that's, that context was in a community of house churches. In fact, Paul spoke that in the book of Ephesians. And in the book of Ephesians, you've got to understand in Ephesus, there were thousands upon thousands of believers and, and hundreds of house churches. You know, many estimates say that there could have been as many as 500 house churches in the city of Ephesus because of, of the population of the city and the fact that they had an impact on the economy and everything else. And Paul wrote to the Ephesians, and then he wrote to Timothy two letters while, uh, while Timothy was in Ephesus. I mean, it was a major hub of, of Christians. Maybe I've seen estimates of 25,000 Christians in Ephesus, and they were all divided up in house churches, uh, you know, met in house churches that were maybe 50 people max, you know, in the homes. And so Paul was writing about all these. So when he's talking about apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, he's talking about citywide. He's talking about body-wide. There are these. You're not going to find all these in a single house church. When we talk about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, from verse 17 through the end, he's talking about people, in starting in verse 17, who were so prejudiced and so biased, they wouldn't come and, and have the Lord's Supper uh, with, with others. Well, we're told in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 9, that there were Greeks, Jews, and Romans all meeting in a Roman man's house named Justice. So the context is the home. The context of the Lord's Supper is the home. Water baptism was context with, within the community of believers, whether, whether people were water baptized in a river or, or whatever the case was, it was still the context of the body uh, ministering to the body to be water baptized, to receive the Lord's Supper. And, and so you have to understand that's the context of that. So just consider, you know, for me, it was, I was horrified actually that I, when the Lord appeared to me, in, uh, well, first it was February of 2001, and then again, secondly, in November of 2001. And in November, telling me to, to start, uh, what he said is, I want you to start a house church and a, and a uh, network of house churches uh, to facilitate the development of house churches around the world. And when I had studied that in 2001, to understand that the whole of the New Testament, the context was church in the home, I was horrified because for 25 years, I had taken my Lord's words out of context and it horrified me that I had lifted them from the home and tried to put them in the auditorium and make them work. And I was horrified. I, I repented of that. Uh, everybody hates 
having their words taken out of context. And I, I just, it just boggled my mind that for 25 years I had, I had mentally known, yes, they met in homes, but I had not realized that, you know, Paul and Peter and James and John and Jude, uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke, they were all writing to people in homes, meeting in homes, and they themselves were, were meeting in homes. And when you see the book of Acts, you can see all the way through that. You can see how that's, how that's true, plus all the house, house churches mentioned. You know, Philemon, where we know Lydia led, and a woman named Nymphus in Colossae. And, um, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Philemon in Colossae, and another woman in Colossae, a woman named Phoebe, was a, was a leader in Centria, which is part of a uh, suburb of Corinth. We have all sorts of house churches. Uh, Lydia in Philippi is what I intended to say. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila in Rome and Ephesus, etc., and the, all those letters are written to people in homes. They're written to people who we know their names. Amazing. The other thing is this. Another thing that the, probably the first thing from that also is the emphasis on the fact that Christ is in me, the hope of glory. And what that means is that the first meaning you would say this is there is no such thing as secular for the believer. You have Christ in you. So that means there's no such thing as secular. There's not, the auditorium thinking is, oh, my pastor has a, a holy job. He's got a, a sacred job, but I just have a secular job. I work in an office. That's all wrong. That's all auditorium church thinking. That's not New Testament thinking. New Testament thinking says you have Christ in you. So therefore, everything you touch, everything you own, everything you possess, everywhere you go, it's sacred because you are sacred. You are now sanctified. You're set apart. That sanctified means to be set apart for the Lord. And so everywhere you go, everything you have, when you go to your office work or when you go to dig a ditch or, or weld something or go teach or go nurse, uh, nursing, whatever the job is that you have, it is a sacred job. There is no such thing as secular when you're a believer because you have Christ in you. You take him everywhere you go. So that has to adjust. You have to adjust your thinking to that. You can't say, well, I'm called into the ministry, but I don't know what to do. No, no, no. You're already in ministry because Christ is in you. And I've covered these things many times about, about how the pastoral gift and, and, and the teacher and the and um, the prophetic and all of these things are already in us. And many times they will manifest themselves in different ways that people earn living. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example again. Um, I, I was sharing this in a Bible school class and I, I asked for a show of hands of those who were called to be pastors and a certain number of hands went up. And, and so I said, so, so what kind of jobs do you have right now? And they were all usually middle level management or something where they, they had a boss above them, but they had people... Uh, around them and beneath them in authority. And I, I said, does this sound common? That people come to you with their problems. They say things like, I don't know why I'm telling you this. Or your office or your cubicle or when you're in the lunchroom or whatever the case is, people just naturally gravitate towards you and share what's going on in their lives. And, and you know, every single one of them, every single one of them said, yeah, that's exactly what happens. I said, you're already functioning in the gift of pastor. Because there's no such thing as, sec as secular for, for a believer. Christ is in you. And if you're called as a pastor, that does not mean necessarily that that means you're going to be standing in a pulpit. That means that where you are right now, you are shepherding the people. You are pastoring them. You are tending the sheep. You are caring for them. You say, they don't even know the Lord. No, not yet. That's why you're there. That's why you're there, to show them the ways of God through your life. And so... I did this through through all the fivefold, you know, the, the prophetic were oftentimes, the prophetic and and, um, and the evangelists were oftentimes uh, in, in sales, in law, in human resources, in policy making, and things like that, because because in a prophetic person, they can, they can see through the accounting books or they can see through the policies. They have this gift to say, this is where the company will be in a year. And it's prophetic. It's still Christ in them manifesting, but in that context. So you see, you have to you have to change your whole thinking to, to think that oh no, I work in a secular job or no, I'm I'm called to the ministry, but I that and you, you think the ministry is pul is a pulpit. Wrong, 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 wrong. There are those. Don't get me wrong. I'm not denying that the, that there are those, but I'm saying that that your gifts of helps and governments and and evangelists. And I asked, I asked how many are called to missions, how much you know evangelism, and a certain number of hands went up. I said, what jobs do you do? They were all in sales and they were in marketing and things like that because the the gift in them to win people to Jesus can also because Christ is in them, 
They have a gift for closing a deal, whether it be insurance or car sales or appliances or whatever the case is. It's because Christ is in them and they have this gift to bring people to Jesus. You know, my gift is to teach the body of Christ. I'm not an evangelist out, out there. I, my, my passion burns to bring people along in the, in the knowledge of, of Christ and, and I'm comfortable in that. I know that is my call. I'm not an evangelist, but there are people who can close a deal. You know, I can teach a person. I mean, when, when, I, when I haven't been in full-time ministry, paid ministry, I've had jobs involving uh, sales. Uh, and, and I found that I just can't do it. I just don't have that gift. I can teach them all about why they need this insurance coverage or why they need this retirement plan or something of that nature. But to get them to close the deal, that gift is just not in me. And, and other people have that gift. That's Christ in them. That's an element of his personality and his presence in them that, that I don't have, but they have. And in the same way, I can teach people the things of God and, and, and everything else. That It's just an element of his personality in me. You have an element of personality of him. He is so vast, so multifaceted that each individual has a part of his personality and you are so unique that only you can share his perspective from your life, what's going on. And that's why meeting in homes, that's why meeting in a, in a small group setting and uh, where you get to, cha to, to share what Christ is doing in you, that's why that is so important. And that's why that was part of the New Testament. Paul wrote repeatedly about Christ in you, the hope of glory. And, and the things related to being in him. There's over a hundred references to either Christ being in us, we in him, or he in us. And so let that change your thinking. There is no such thing as, as secular for you. It's all sacred. You right now can function in whatever that gift is, that passion, wherever you are and whatever you're doing right now. It doesn't matter uh, what the title is. It's Christ in you manifesting himself. And how man puts the title on it doesn't matter. But, but it's Christ in you uh, manifesting himself to others. You know, there's, a, there's another element um, in there, and I, I hesitate talking about it too much, but it has to do with the recognition of, of paying the price to walk in love to meet with others. Let me, let me put it this way. The context in there is, let me shift gears. Because, because I, I hadn't intended to talk this all this about house church and the importance of networking and some of the prophetic things the Lord told me about the importance of, of having each other in times to come. So, so let me just say this. What Christ in you, I'm going to shift gears. What Christ in you means, and I'll cover that perhaps next week. What Christ in you means is that you have authority over the devil. You know, Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 20, he said, These signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Many times people are like, I'm, I'm under a demonic attack. Pray for me. No, that's wrong. I'm under a de demonic attack. Well, then rise up. You've got Christ in you. You've got the authority to use the name of Jesus. Obey Jesus. That's all it is. Just obey Jesus. You've got Christ in you. I take authority over you, spirit that's attacking me in the name of Jesus. I command you away from me. I command this attack to stop. Don't bother me again. Now, Heavenly Father, I'm asking you for angelic protection. Put a buffer between us. I've done my part. I'm using the name of Jesus. I've cast that, that spirit out. I've cut off that attack. I've got Christ in me. I'm doing what I know to do. Now, Father, could you put a buffer around? Could you perhaps send angels or something to protect me from this in the name of Jesus? And you're done. The, the thing of Christ in you means that you have the authority to use the name of Jesus against demons. That's an amazing thing. You're not subject to them. There's so many ministries that are out there that, that use fear to keep people subjugated to themselves. That, you know, if you don't tune in next week, you may be subject to the devil. Pastors will say, if you leave this church, you're opening yourselves up to an attack of the devil. I've, I've had people come to me and they've talked about how their pastor has said things like, well, this family so-and-so left the church. You can't talk to them. Don't talk to them anymore. They're under demonic influence. You know, they're being, they're hearing a devil. They've left this church. That's, that's pure manipulation. Don't give in to that. You've got Christ in you. You've got the ability to take authority over demons. So don't be afraid of, of the devil. And, and, and don't think that if you don't tune in next week, uh, you know, you're going to open yourselves up to an attack. Anyway, sorry, I got sidetracked and, and went on, but this is a live thing. So anyway, God bless you. CWOWI.org. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. 
use the name of Jesus.